online paedophiles are using artificial intelligence to de-age celebrities and then create hyper-realistic images of child sexual exploitation. It's the Internet Watch Foundation. They say images of well-known female singers and actors are being reimagined as children and they're then being shared by predators. The Home Secretary, Swella Braverman, has committed to tackle what she's described as the alarming rise in despicable AI-generated images of children being sexually exploited by paedophiles. How do you tackle this? Well, joining me in the studio is barrister and futurist Andrew Ebon, who is an expert somewhat in AI. Andrew, I've sort of just laid out the details there. It's absolutely revolting. What is happening? It's These tools are available to the public and people are using them for the most grotesque means. Well, you're absolutely right. And I, I often say it's our greatest human achievement, but also the biggest potential existential threat. And what it can do, AI, artificial intelligence, can basically enable you to manipulate images. So they can look on a sort of amusing way, like the, the, the Pope in a puffer jacket we had fairly recently, and people were very fooled by that. But it can also be used for bad purposes. So, because they're hyper-realistic. Uh, hyper-realistic. Tom, Tom Hanks was advertising a dental campaign, which he never endorsed or anything. The really sickening story here is where they've de-aged actors and actresses and so on and so forth, taking them back to their childhood, if you like, and put them... It's pornographic imagery. And there's a couple of things there. There's obviously the general law applies about child abuse, and that applies not just to photographs of child abuse, but also what they call pseudo-photographs. So AI-manipulated photographs, the same rules apply. And, and the same when there was somebody who was convicted about the cartoon versions. Uh, you get these manga, very sexually explicit images and so on and so forth. What's really important is, is to work out the protection in place. And there's two things. is understand what the technology can do. And I always say question everything. We also need to make sure that the law catches up with these sort of things. And whilst there is certain protection in criminal law at the moment, there's a summit taking place in Bletchley Park at the beginning of November, which is called the AI Safety Summit. And people from around the world will be coming there and talking about, look, the advantages, tremendous advantages for artificial intelligence. There's been seismic movements in terms of advances in medicine in terms of creativity and so on and so forth. But it also can be used for terrible things as well. So what are the conversations going on about how you police the use of AI? Is it that the regulation and how we use it is just miles behind the development of the technology? Is it that it should be a situation where only certain bodies or people have access to use these tools? Well, it's interesting. I mean, if, if you have a fork, you can use it for eating spaghetti, you can stub somebody in the back. What you need to do is regulate what you do. You don't ban AI, which is uh, something people have been suggesting. What you do is regulate the use of it. So as I say, there's certain protections in law already about pr producing deep fake images, especially if it's child exploitation and so on and so forth. We're looking at taking it further and turning around and saying, look, maybe there are ways, should be ways of identifying this sort of stuff. We've just had the online safety bill, which has now been passed by the House of Lords. It's waiting royal assent. But what it will do is basically pornography, if that's been produced by AI, basically that will become an offence as well. So it's looking at that sort of side and making that make sense. Are you, you're across this field, you know, from the legal perspective, from the AI perspective, are you comfortable with, the, with where legislation is now that it is sufficient enough to be able to handle when people use it for malicious means. Well, there are a couple of things in there because basically AI is first of all it's dependent on scraping the internet for copyright works. And I, I was in Cannes at the TV festival doing the drama awards down there, but also looking at the threats and opportunities. And front and centre of the writers' strike and also the actors' strike in America is artificial intelligence. And it was Goldman Sachs who said it's going to re replace 300 million jobs. So we need to look at that sort of side. We need to work out about from a copyright point of view, how are we going to deal with the information that needs to go into the machine to be fed to spit it out again? And that's down to licensing. We need to find out a, an economic way, a fair and equitable way of doing things. I'll give you an example. An actor can be re uh, recorded for just one day and we can use them in a movie in many different scenes forever. That's what's going to happen with this technology. What we need to do is work out a fair way of compensating them. Um, I often quote the example of Bruce Willis, who has aphasia and he can no longer act, but he licensed his name, image and, and voice and so on and so forth to a, a Russian telecom company for several million dollars. And they worked out some sort of economics on, on that sort of basis. Grimes, the artist, turned around and said, look, she'll share copyright with the AI creators using that sort of stuff on, on that sort of basis for, with her works. Mm. But we need to, the, basically, the law all needs to catch up in terms of copyright and how we deal with that fair economic side, but also making sure the appropriate safeguards are in place about the use of it subsequently.